The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, good morning, uh, everyone, and good afternoon to others. We'd like to thank you for attending our webinar today on masks, gowns, and drapes. Uh, this webinar will cover the relevant standards and methods for face masks, gowns, and drape testing. Uh, here to present on this webinar will be Ben Miller, one of our resident experts here at Nelson Laboratories. Just as a, a mode of uh, information, uh, in the future, you can always, uh, if you miss one of our webinars, you can go back to our webinars page under the Knowledge Center of the Nelson Labs website uh, a few days after the event, and you can view the recorded webinar. Uh, you can receive uh, notifications about webinars, seminars, trade shows, and other uh, events uh, by becoming a fan of the Nelson Labs uh, Facebook page or following us on Twitter. As for the webinar, uh, we welcome all of your questions and that you can submit them at any time. Um, at the last 15 minutes of the event, Ben will randomly answer as many questions as he can during that last 15 minutes. Uh, if you have something that's a product specific question, uh, we ask that you just write it down and you can contact Ben about it after the webinar. You'll be able to reach Ben at 801-290-7827. Now let me just uh, give you a little bit of background information on Ben. Um, ben has been with Nelson Laboratories for six years, serving as a aer aerobiology department manager. He has a bachelor's of science from BYU Hawaii. Ben is a committee member of the ASTM F23 and the ASTM D11 standards. He is a certified microbiologist with the National Registry of, of Microbiologists, a certified microbiologist. We'd like to welcome Ben. The time is now yours. All right, thanks Mike. And thank you all for joining us today for this barrier testing webinar. Um, today, sorry, we're having some technical difficulty already in the first 10 seconds. Um, well, our our um, presentation today is going to be broken down into two parts. Um, the first part is going to be gowns and drapes, and the second part will be masks. There we go. So um, what we'll do is we'll go over the test methods first of all, and then we'll proceed on to the guidance documents at, that refer to these test methods so that we can put this all into context. Uh, it's a pretty broad scope today, so we're going to have to move pretty quickly to get through it all. Um, but like Mike said, be sure to submit your questions, and we can uh, hopefully address um, all the questions you have. Okay, the first test method um, is a gown and drape barrier test method called ASTM F1670, or synthetic blood testing. Uh, this test method was designed to test the, the product against uh, penetration by blood and body fluids. And it's a precursor test to the viral penetration test. It uses uh, synthetic blood that's been adjusted to mimic real blood. And there's a picture of it there in that slide. Uh, um, the viscosity, surface tension, and density has all been uh, meant to match that of real blood. Uh, the test entails cutting samples out from a your um, product into three inch by three inch squares and they're then conditioned for 24 hours at 21 degrees C and 65 percent relative humidity prior to actual testing. Uh, once conditioning is finished and the samples are loaded into a test cell, um, they're, they're sandwiched between two silicone gaskets and then uh, clamped down using the bolts and torques to about 120 inch pounds of pressure. Uh, you can see in this picture a loaded test sample. Um, it's, it's important to note the orientation of the test sample in the test cell. So you can see the blood's being added to the reservoir at the back of the test cell, and it's in contact with the sample um, on what's called the test side of the test sample. And the side we can see through the window, uh, the plastic window in the front, is going to be the non-test side or the assay side. Um, and that the test side is usually the outside of your product if it's a gown, um, because we're trying to mimic protecting the wearer from the the blood or the bloodborne pathogen. So the blood is added to the test cell. Um, it's it's in contact with the sample for five minutes at no applied pressure. And after five minutes, if nothing is coming through, or uh, 
penetrating the sample, then it goes for an additional one minute, but this time the pressure is um, increased to two PSI. And this is the point where you're going to see most of the uh, failures of your sample because the, the pressure is going to push the blood through any anomalies or holes in the sample. Here's an example of what a failure might look like. Uh, just a lot of, this one has a lot of pores leaking blood through. So at this point, this sample would be um, deemed a failure and testing would be stopped. If the sample at this point doesn't fail, there's an additional 54 minutes um, of no applied pressure. So the pressure is relieved and it sits in contact with the blood for another 54 minutes. So the total exposure time to the blood is one hour. At the end of that one hour period, if the sample uh, hasn't shown any visual failures, then it's given a pass result. And here's just some stats about that test. Uh, if you're going to send in samples, uh, you should budget about two weeks or 14 to 17 days for a turnaround time. The minimum per the standard is three samples, and the sample size is going to be three inches by three inches. And that's going to be approximately $80 per sample. And these prices are just approximate um, prices as well. Okay, so then the next test we're going to talk about is the viral penetration test, or ASTM F1671. Um, this test is basically the same as the synthetic blood penetration test, except for a virus is introduced into the into the mix. So we have some vocabulary that we'll go over, some some microbiology vocabulary, just to uh, put everything in context. So the, the words virus, bacteriophage, and FIX174 are used interchangeably. Um, FIX174 is the name of the virus that's used for testing, and it's a specific type of virus called a bacteriophage. Um, and a bacteriophage is a virus that in, in infects bacteria or uses bacteria as a host. And in this case, the host for the virus is E. coli. Um, and we've all heard of E. coli before. Um, nutrient broth, media, sterile media, these are all um, used interchangeably. Um, Phyx NBT is the name of the nutrient broth that we use. Um, Phyx meaning it's been uh, optimized to for the Phyx 174 bacteria. NB stands for nutrient broth, and then the T in Phyx NBT means that tween has been added to adjust the surface tension to mimic that of actual blood and body fluids. Okay, once the virus is added to the nutrient broth, uh, we call it the challenge. So this is what's actually going to be added to the test cell um, is the challenge. And the challenge concentration, the concentration of virus in the challenge is um, referred to as the titer. And it's measured in PFU per mil. And, and PFU is plaque forming unit. Um, a plaque meaning um, it, it's equivalent of a, of a single colony on like a petri dish. I will show a picture of it right here. So on your left is uh, what a plate would look like without any growth on it. Um, no E. coli. It could have virus or it could not have virus. We can't tell because we don't have the E. coli lawn to, uh, to see the plaques. Uh, in the middle there is a, just a plate that has E. coli growing on it. It's kind of got a red tinge to it. It's just a, a real nice E. coli lawn. And then on the right are, is a plate that has a bunch of plaques on it. So each one of those circles is a, where a virus has um, basically infected and, and, and eaten um, into the E. coli lawn. Each one of those represents a, a single virus. Okay, a little bit about the Phyx 174 bacteriophage. It's very small, 27 nanometers, um, in comparison to hepatitis B, which is one of the smallest known human pathogens, which is 42 nanometers. Um, it's a small, almost round, almost spherical um, shape. It's actually icosahedral, which means it has 20 sides to it. So I'm probably the only nerd that played Dungeons and Dragons, but that's a, like a 20-sided dice. Um, it's uh, non-enveloped and non-charged, and it's not pathogenic to humans, so it's uh, good to use in the laboratory. Okay, so the first phase of ASTM 1671 testing is called compatibility. Um, this is not to be confused with biocompatibility. Uh, it's, just, it's just testing to see if the sample is compatible with the viral penetration test. Um, because we're, we're using E. coli and virus for this test, we have to make sure the sample doesn't um, neutralize or kill those 
organisms. Otherwise, the test won't be we'll, we won't be able to run the test. And so, what compatibility testing entails is applying a known amount of virus to the sample. So that blue square would be your your sample. We'd apply say a thousand viruses or PFU to it, and see how much we could recover after a one hour exposure period. One hour because that's the exposure time of the the actual test. So if we can recover all of the virus that we put on, we, we say we have a compatibility ratio of one, uh, meaning everything is good. There is no loss of virus. However, most of the time, we're not going to be able to recover everything that we put on. So for example, if we put down 1,000 PFU and we can only recover 500, uh, we get a compatibility ratio of two. And why that's important is because we use that number to uh, adjust the titer or concentration of virus we use in the actual tests so that we can be sure that we can detect um, small uh, failures of a sample by putting enough virus on. Um, so we can, we can make that adjustment for small or low compatibility ratios. However, once the compatibility ratio gets too high, um, we may have to say that the, the sample is not suitable for this test just because it may wipe out all of the organisms and it would be too much for us to compensate for. Um, this test, the compatibility portion only has to be done once per sample. Um, so if you're doing like lot release testing, you can use the same compatibility ratio over and over as long as the, nothing has changed in the production of your product. Um, some of the things that can affect the compatibility ratio are, are just glues, adhesives, dyes. Um, the texture can affect how hard it is to recover the virus from the sample, a really absorbent uh, type sample, it's going to be harder to pull that virus back off once it's on. Um, so we'll have to, it, we'll have a higher compatibility ratio. Um, and then antimicrobial properties, whether engineered or unintentional, um, can affect the, the compatibility ratio. Okay, so after we have the compatibility ratio, we move into actual testing. And like I said, this is a, a lot like the synthetic blood test. Uh, we cut out three inch by three inch samples or squares from the test product. This time it's all done aseptically because we're, we're uh, using microbiology techniques. Again, it's uh, conditioned for 24 hours, same as it was before. Um, loaded into a test cell, same orientation, test side towards the reservoir. Um, and it's also uh, bolted or torqued down to 120 inch pounds. And then the challenge is added to the reservoir. Uh, so in this syringe would be um, the nutrient broth with the virus in it. Um, and again, it will sit for five minutes with no pressure. And then one minute at two PSI. And again, we're looking for visual failures. So here's an example of a visual failure with the viral penetration test. Um, and I, again, at this point, if we saw that visual failure, the test would stop and the sample would receive a, a failing uh, result. But if we don't see any visual failure at this point, we continue on for the 54 minutes to, to make the total hour of exposure time uh, to the challenge. Okay. Um, at the end of this hour, the challenge is then drained from that test cell. And some sterile nutrient broth, this is, this is the broth without the virus in it, is, uh, is applied to the face of the test sample the non-test side, and it's swirled around there for one minute in an attempt to recover any virus that has penetrated from the, the reservoir side through to the assay side. And if any virus are, are there, they should be picked up by that nutrient broth. And then that nutrient broth is recovered back up off the test sample and put into a test tube. And in that test tube, uh, the contents are plated with uh, E. coli and a um, little bit of top auger on that plate and then they're incubated um, overnight. So the next day we look at what grew in the plates. You can see here, um, again, if just the E. coli grew, um, it would be a pass, there'd be no virus in it. And then on the right you can see what a failure would look like. You'd, all the, the plaques would show up um, that came through the test sample. And here's some information about that testing. It's about 15 to 18 days for, for a, a turnaround time. Um, the minimum number of samples per the standard is three. Um, 
but you need an additional three samples for compatibility testing. So the minimum would be actually six three-inch by three-inch samples. Um, and it's about 160 per sample um, and 160 for the total compatibility testing. Okay, some of the frequently asked questions about the viral penetration test. Um, did my product pass the ASTM 1671 test? That's a little bit difficult to answer whether the product passed. Um, per sample, we can give results. We could say three out of three samples passed, or three, two out of three, or nine out of ten. But really, the whether your product passed the viral penetration test should be based upon um, statistics or statistically a valid um, number of samples that are tested. Um, what constitutes a failure? One PFU. So only one plaque means the sample failed, which is it's a really sensitive. Like it's, that's just one 27 nanometer virus getting through um, the sample constitutes a failure. And as far once we have a failure, can we tell how or where the sample failed? Well, we we can know a little bit, but but not a lot. And it kind of depends on the type of failure it was. So if we have a visual failure, we can say um, Obviously, we saw this, the failure come from the seam or the tie or wherever we saw it come through. And then um, not only did we see it visually, but we saw it when it was assayed on the plate. However, if we have a non-visual failure, so there's a picture of a non-visual failure on the left, really there's nothing to indicate how that sample failed or where it failed from. Um, all we can see is on the right that virus did get through in, in a you know a microscopic capacity. Um, and we detected it, but we don't know how it got through or where it got through. So that's one of the limitations of the test. It doesn't tell us a lot of information other than it passed or failed. Um, so some of the troubleshooting, what, anytime we see a failure, we need to make sure it's a valid test and a valid failure. So some of the controls we run are a negative control, which needs to be free from plaques. Um, then we run a blank. Um, this is actually optional per the standard. Um, but if you have an extra sample that you can send in, we can run a blank, and that's just um, a test sample that goes through the whole test process without being subjected to the actual virus. So just sterile MBT will be added to the reservoir rather than virus. And then we know if we, we see a virus or any plaques on that blank sample at the end that it was introduced um, in some other way than, uh, than running the actual test method, and that would invalidate a um, the failure of the, of the group of samples. Um, another thing we do is we put out follow-up plates to monitor the environment of testing, just to say, to make sure that there's not um, any aerosolized virus in the air that may have settled on the samples or or in the test area that that could cause a false failure. And did the sample remain seated properly in the test cell? So once we load it into that test cell um, and it's gone through testing, we unload all those samples and check as we're unloading to make sure that they were seated properly on the gaskets um, and, and there's no way that the virus could have come around an improperly sealed or seated sample. And so all those um, controls are done prior to sending out a final report. So um, those are done automatically, but there's still good, good for you to know, good questions to ask when you, have, when you do see a, a failure. Um, another potential cause of failure is, is from what's called wicking. And what wicking is, um, is when the sample fails due to uh, the virus coming not through the proper, not through the sample. So if you look on the left of this diagram, a true failure, if this is a test, si test sample uh, sandwiched in between the test cell, so on the left would be the reservoir containing the virus and it would pass through your sample to the assay side on the right, that would be a true failure because it came, actually came through the sample. In the middle is a, a failure due to wicking where, let's say that test sample may have an impermeable film in the middle and something absorbent on each side of it. Um, so the, the challenge would wick through the absorbent part of the sample up out of the test area and back around um, into the assay area without, without actually penetrating the sample. Um, it would show up as a failure because you'd get um, plaques on your final plate, but it wouldn't truly be a failure because the barrier actually works. Um, what we can do to prevent that is seal the edge of it, um, which prevents that, that
that wicking from occurring. You can see on the right there. And the way we do that most commonly is by sealing with paraffin wax. So here's an example of a sample that might be prone to wicking. And so we just dip the edges in paraffin wax. Um, and that works good to stop wicking failures. Uh, one of the, the weaknesses with this is that paraffin wax, uh, when it's molten, is about 55 degrees Celsius. So if your uh, sample has a film or some sort of polymer that is um, maybe has a melting point around 55, this might not be the best way to seal. Or if the paraffin uh, reacts with your product, again, it might not be the best way to seal it. And there are other options um, we can use. Okay, and that, that's basically wicking. Another potential cause of failure is deflection, the last uh, thing on this slide. And what deflection is is when a, a sample, here's a picture of a, of a latex or a nitrile glove under 2 psi pressure. You can see that it's just distended out. Now, if that's your sample, it doesn't have to be a latex sample. It could be a, um, just a non-woven sample with a, a seam in it, and that, that stretching may... Uh, tear glue or, or make the tape slip. And so that's going to be something that you're not going to necessarily see in real use, but will cause it to fail the, the test here. And that's actually addressed in the standard um, with method A or method B. Uh, method A is just loading like we had described earlier. Uh, but me best, no, sorry, method B uh, uses a, a retaining screen to keep that sample from distending under pressure. So you can see it would be loaded on the right there with a gasket, a test sample gasket, and then a screen would be added and another gasket, and it would be a torque down into that test cell. Um, and that is, is uh, viral penetration testing in a nutshell. Next uh, test we're going to talk about is the hydrostatic head pressure test. Um, this is a relatively straightforward test. It uses um, uh, an instrument to measure the, the pressure of water coming through a test sample. So uh, and it, your test sample would be cut and clamped into this instrument. And you can see in the top right-hand corner of this picture, there's a little tiny drop of water coming through the, the sample. So according to this uh, standard, when the third, it actually takes three drops of water to be constituted as a failure. So you'd see one more, and then the third drop, you'd note the pressure that that happened at, and that would be the pressure that's um, reported as your failure pressure. Um, again, some frequently asked questions about that are, um, did my product pass a hydrostatic head pressure test? Well, that's, again, a hard question to answer because there's nothing set out in that standard saying that um, a 10 centimeters of water is, is a pass and, or 20 or 100. Um, it just requires a reporting of the results. Um, another thing that we see a lot is uh, a sample will pass hydrostatic head pressure, say with greater than 200 centimeters of water, but as soon as it's, it's uh, submitted to viral penetration or 1670 testing, it fails visually um, at 2 psi, which is less than 200. Uh, why is that? Um, and one, one of the possible reasons for that is the surface tension. So in hydrostatic head pressure testing, we use water, um, which has a surface tension of about 72 dynes, whereas we've adjusted our, our challenge in the other two tests to around 42 dynes. So it has a, a, a way, um, way more wetting characteristics um, that can cause us to see that failure at a lower pressure. Um, and it's about a two-week turnaround time for hydrostatic head pressure, a minimum of five samples. And the sample size on this is, is uh, eight by eight. And it's going to be around $45 a sample. OK, the next, uh, the fourth barrier test we're going to talk about here is AATCC42, or impact penetration, or sometimes called spray impact, or spray impact penetration testing. Um, and you can see here the sample is attached, sealed to a clipboard, and you can barely make out the outline of a piece of blotter paper underneath that test sample. Um, and what happens is that blotter paper is weighed before and after water is, is uh, dropped onto this sample, and the difference in weight is what is reported as the penetration um, for, of the test. So here's another picture where the water is, is dropped from a, 
a set height. Um, some frequently asked questions about this test. Uh, same thing as the other test, did my sample pass uh, impact penetration testing? Again, the standard doesn't set forth any pass-fail criteria. It just requires us to report the amount of penetration in grams of water. So you could get, you know, one gram, less than one gram, five grams, ten grams, uh, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, but there's no pass or fail necessarily. Um, an important thing is how the sample is oriented um, relative uh, to the, the water. Uh, so the sample needs to be cut so that it's a 7 by 13 inch sample and it should be cut so that the machine direction of the fabric is lengthwise. Uh, so for that reason it's important to uh, to know what the machine direction of your fabric is when you send it in for testing. And it's about a two-week turnaround time. Again, minimum of five samples. Uh, 7 by 13 is sample size and it's about $50 per sample. Okay, the, and those are the first four tests for um, uh, gowns and drapes that we're going to talk about. Now, we're going to talk a little about some guidance documents that refer to those tests. The first one is going to be the FDA's guidance document, the 510K uh, guidance document, which was published way back in 1993. And back then, it wasn't, there wasn't much said other than uh, it lists some of these test um, methods. So th this is right from, on the left is what's listed in the guidance document. You can see three of those four tests are listed. Um, they're under a little bit different designation. So ASTM ES21 and ES22 are now called ASTM 1670 and 71. Um, but they're the same tests, basically, and then hydrostatic spray is also listed in that uh, FDA guidance document. And that's about all it says. It says you should, these are some tests you should look at. So about 10 years later, Amy published the, the PB70 document, which gives us a little more um, direction as, as far as uh, pass-fail results, what should be tested, where should be tested some gowns and drapes. Um, so the, the Amy PB70 document is called the Liquid Barrier Performance and Classification of Pro Protective Apparel in uh, and Drapes in Healthcare Facilities, long name. Um, and it entails the four tests that we just talked about. So here's a a table from that document and you can see um, you can have one of four levels. So level one is going to require just the spray impact testing that we just talked about. It's going to give you an actual number as, as far as what is required for a level one. So you need to have a less than four and a half grams of penetration. And then on the right it says you have to show a 4% AQL to, to reach that level one. Um, so you need to have a, a sampling plan in place that's able to prove that you tested and can show 4% or less um, AQL or acceptable quality level. And again, um, as we go up, um, it introduces the other tests. So level two is going to introduce the hydrostatic head pressure test. Level three requires both tests as well. And then the, the requirements get tighter um, as we go up. And then level four, we introduce the viral pen and synthetic blood test. Um, and just an important thing to note here is that uh, for the Amy PB70 document, you only have to test to the highest level. So um, if I wanted a level four rating, I could just test, say, 1671 or 1670 if it was a drape. I wouldn't have to test all the levels before. I wouldn't have to do the spray or hydro testing to get that level four um, necessarily. We'll go over that. It's not, it's not, actually, it's not quite that simple, but... Um, Let's continue on. So here's a picture of a, a gown from the MEPB 70 document. It breaks it down into um, four different category or four different zones of the gown. So area A and B are the, called the critical zones of the gown because they're going to be the, th the areas that are most likely to come in contact with your infectious uh, material. So that's the chest area and basically the sleeve from the cuff to the elbow. And then area C is the non-reinforced front of the gown and area D is going to be the back of the gown. Um, and then it goes on to say that each of these areas needs to meet a certain level to get a final classification. So, for example, if you want a final classification of your gown as level, level four, then you need to test 
um, area A and area B to level four, then area C can you have the option of choosing um, level one testing two, three, or four, and then area D same thing. The back of the gown can be labeled non-protective, or you can show a level one, two, three, or four testing. Um, same thing with the drape. You basically have a, a critical zone, area A, and uh, and the rest of the, the drape, which is area B. And you also have that seam in between, which we'll talk about. Um, so, and this is just an example. Most of the time, most drapes aren't this simple. They they're a lot more complicated. So it takes a little more figuring out to to tell what the zones are and where the seams are and what needs to be tested. Um, same thing, the, for a final classification, only the critical area needs to be level four. The, the non-critical area can be can show level one, two, three, or four um, testing. So some important excerpts from that document um, are that the seams between the protective areas should um, have at least the barrier performance of the lower performing area. Okay, well, and we'll, I'll just uh, go through these real quick, and then we'll uh, kind of explain them as we go through an example. Um, all critical zone components must meet the criti criteria specified in the table. So a critical zone component is anything that's in that area A um, or B for a gown. That could be a, a seam, it could be a tie, or any kind of point of, point of attachment. And um, it's also important to note that if you're sending in samples, um, that the specimens need to be taken from different products, but the products all need to be from the same lot. And we'll go through that here in an example. So for example, if we have a, a drape that we're trying to um, test for an Amy level two, what would we need to test? Uh, first of all, we need to test the critical area, or critical zone A. Um, and if we're doing a level two, according to the table we just looked at, we need to test spray and hydro. Um, and then the spray results are less, we have to have less than one gram of penetration um, for the water. And then hydro has to be greater than 20 centimeters of water um, before it fails. And then 32 samples I have on here because um, remember we're trying to reach that, show that 4% AQL. So for a 4% AQL that has a, a sample size of 32, uh, 29 of those 32 need to pass. If you have three failures, you're acceptable. If you have four, it's a uh, a rejection. Okay, so then we'd have to test area B. Remember, area B, according to the table, we can choose between demonstrating level one, two, three, or four. Um, so just in the interest of saving money, we'll, we can just demonstrate that it meets the level one, which is less than uh, four and a half grams of penetration from the spray impact test. And then the excerpt we read says that the, the area between the two uh, protective areas or the seam between the two protective areas has to show at least the barrier properties of the lower performing area. So this seam needs to show that we, ha we have at least less than four and a half grams or at least a level one rating. So that's basically what you'd submit and test for a Amy level two gown. And that would entail basically 32 drapes um, because we have to take them from different products but they have to be of the same lot. So you need to submit 32 drapes of the same lot and they'd have to be large enough to take 96 7 by 13 samples um, from each of those colored areas. So three per drape or one per zone A, B, and A, B, A slash B, I guess. Um, and then we'd have to be able to get 32 8 by 8 samples for the hydro testing. So minimum of 32 drapes, maybe more if the drape isn't large enough to get all those samples cut out of. Um, and then here's an example of the holy grail of surgical gowns, the Amy level four surgical gown. Um, so area A, we'd have to show it meets level four so that, again, if our sample size was 32, we'd have to have 29 of 32 pass from area A. We'd have to have the sleeves and the critical components of the sleeves tested, so that's the sleeve seams. So 32 would be tested, 29 would have to pass. Area C, remember we have the option of demonstrating a level one, two, three, or four. So in interest of um, cost, probably we'd uh, just test it to a level one, do the spray impact and show that it meets a, a level or less than four and a half grams of water penetration. And then area D, again we can 
demonstrate level one, two, three, four, or label as non-protective. So in the interest of cost, maybe we'd want to just label the back as non-protective. Um, and then we, ha we have to remember that anything that's in the, those critical zones also needs to be tested. So if we had a tie attachment point, say, in the, in the critical zone on the front, we'd have to test that. Um, and uh, one thing you could do if you're, in, if you're at the engineering part or the design part of your um, product, you could um, think about moving that critical zone or that attachment point out of the critical zone, say to the pack, back of the sample, um, which you may or may not want to do. But if you did that, you could label as non-protective. So uh, maybe a hard uh, a part of your gown or an engineered part of your gown that's hard to get to pass um, a level four could be moved out of the critical zone and then not be required to pass, say, viral penetration testing. And so that's going to basically require um, a minimum of 32 gowns, again, to be submitted, um, all of the same lots. So we'd have to take 64 3 inch by 3 inch samples from those gowns, uh, two from each gown, so one from area A, one from area B, for the viral pen testing. Then we'd have to take 32 samples from area C uh, of 7 by 13. So that, that's for the spray impact testing. Um, and that's assuming we're just going to label the back as non-protective and there's no other um, seams or ties or points of attachment that we need to address. And that's how you get a Amy Level 4 gown tested. Um, and that sums up the first half of our uh, presentation, which is the gown and drape testing. So go ahead and let us know if you have any questions on that. Um, and I'm going to proceed on to the face mask test part of the presentation. So we're going to start here with the BFE test, or bacterial filtration efficiency. This test is uh, laid out in ASTM F2101 and, again, in EN14683. And they're basically the same test in both standards. Um, an important thing to note here is, um, as in the title of F2101, is that it's a medical face mask material test. Uh, meaning if you have a product that's um, where fit is an issue, like a respirator, um, this probably isn't the direction you want to go. You probably want to move more towards the NIOSH type testing. Um, but just for face mask materials, um, this is the, the way to go. And so what the test entails basically, here's a diagram from the, the ASTM standard. Um, and my mouse isn't showing up here, but... Uh, basically, that, that tall um, labeled aerosol chamber in the uh, kind of to the left of the picture is where um, the, the bacteria is suspended in an aerosol form, and it's pulled down by vacuum through that um, Anderson sampler at the bottom of the picture. And your sample would be um, at the bottom of that aerosol chamber, but before the uh, Anderson sampler, and it would we we have a known amount of a known concentration of aerosol or aerosol aerosolized bacteria in that chamber, um, and it would be basically filtered out through your thing and captured on plates or petri dishes in that Anderson sampler. Uh, here's a picture of it of it in real life, so you can see uh, the challenge organism in the top right almost is is uh, pulled through that peristaltic pump. Um, into a nebulizer and then nebulized into the aerosol in that glass tube. And at the bottom of the glass tube where that rubber stopper is above the stainless steel looking uh, Anderson sampler is where your uh, sample would be clamped in. Um, and then inside the Anderson sampler, as we'll see later, um, are all the petri dishes where you capture all the, the virus that's aerosolized in that uh, chamber. Okay, so the, the organism that we use in this test is uh, Staph aureus. It's a pretty common organism, especially in hospitals. Uh, and for a positive control, we want to make sure that we're delivering 2,200 bacteria or colony-forming units per test. And then the mean particle size of those uh, bacteria needs to be about 3 microns. And we'll talk about how we control that in just a second. Um, another important thing to note for this is that there has to be a 1 CFM uh, 
airflow pulled through the test sample. So this is important because uh, it limits what we can test in this. So this is, the, the sample has to allow at least one CFM of flow. So this is great for a, something that you can breathe through, like a face mask, but a, a gown or drape or something, a barrier like that is probably not going to allow one CFM flow through it. Um, and so it isn't going to be applicable for, or appropriate for the BFE test. Um, and that, that bacteria is aerosolized in that chamber or pumped into that chamber for one minute um, while it's being pulled through the sample. And then after the delivery of the bacteria stops, it's the air and bacteria from the chamber is pulled for an additional minute. So the total uh, exposure or test time is going to be two minutes. Um, and then to keep it all in control, to meet those numbers that we talked about, 2200 uh, CFU per test, we're going to run a positive control to make sure that's what's what we're getting, um, and we're going to do that repeatedly uh, throughout testing, every 5 to 11 samples to make sure that the, the test system is delivering properly. And there's also a negative control ran that uh, just uh, to make sure that we're not getting bacteria in the system when we don't want it there. Um, there are some preconditioning requirements. This is one of the only differences between the ASTM and the EN method. So the ASTM method is going to require four hours of conditioning prior to testing at 21 degrees C and a set point of 85% re relative humidity. Um, but the EN uh, standard requires 20 degrees C and 65% relative humidity. So a slight difference there between the two methods. Um, so samples are tested the same way a positive control is ran. And then after uh, the test is, is run, the plates from those Anderson samplers are incubated for two days at 37 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's important to note because we can't really see any results from this test until at least two days after it's been ran because we can't get the bacteria to grow any faster than nature allows them to. Okay, here's a, um, a breakdown of the Anderson sampler that's used in that test method. So you can see here it's labeled um, there are six stages. So stage one is going to have the largest holes. Stage six will be the smallest hole. Um, and as the bacteria f comes through the this Anderson sampler, it's uh, the there's going to be petri dishes on each of these stages, and the bacteria will impact to those um, petri dishes based on the size of the the aerosol. And so you can see that the Anderson sampler kind of mimics the uh, human respiratory system. And we're looking for a 3 micron uh, mean particle size. So that's going to be around stage 3 and stage 4 is where you want to see most of your um, bacteria captured. Um, so this slide shows us the six. So these, these are the petri dishes that would be in that Anderson sampler. And you can kind of see uh, the distribution here where there's, there's less um, large bacteria captured at stage one and stage small bacteria at stage six, and it kind of peaks almost in the center there, um, giving us that mean particle size or that distribution of particles um, at three microns. Um, and this is also how we, we make sure that the, the 2200 CFUs delivered per test, this is actually the plates from a positive control. Um, so the BFE test is about uh, two-week turnaround time, or 14 to 17 days. The minimum number of samples is five, and the sample size is about four inches by four inches, but um, it's usually just a full face mask is what's tested. Uh, and the cost is about 110 per sample on that. Um, and again, even though the minimum is five, uh, just like with the other tests, uh, statistically, if valid amount of samples needs to be tested to make sure that uh, you know, you're supporting your the claim of your product. Okay, differential pressure is a test that goes along with BFE. Um, it, it, it's basically measuring the the breathability of your mask, and there's two methods for this. There's the mil spec, which is associated a lot with the ASTM method, and then the EN 14683 method, which um, goes with the BFE of the same test method. Uh, but basically, they're the same same test method. Uh, here's a picture of the apparatus. So that little white thing on the right, the sample holder, um, would clamp the sample in between those 
those two white things where the black uh, O-ring looking seal is. Um, and then a vacuum would be pulled and one of these manometers would be used to measure the differential pressure between both sides of the, of the test sample. Um, and you could have to use a liquid manometer or digital manometer there. Um, and for that test, it's, a, it's an 8 liter flow that's pulled through that. Um, the test area is about 4.9 square centimeters, and then it needs to be tested at five different locations per sample. And then one of the, the few, di or the only differences between the two um, methods is that the mil spec doesn't require the sample to be preconditioned, and the EN um, method does require preconditioning four hours at 20 degrees C. 65% relative humidity. And for differential pressure, the turnaround time is about eight days. Number of samples, uh, minimum number is five, and same four by four inch sample or full mask. And um, we have it priced out per set of five, which is about $160. Okay, um, our last test, test method here is the ASTM F1862 or splash resistant test. Um, and this is a, a method that is, is a, well, let me just show the picture here. Um, it it uh, tests the ability of a face mask to resist um, a splash of blood, say, from an artery or something during surgery. So this is the apparatus. You can see on the left um, that a reservoir would hold synthetic blood. This is the same synthetic blood that was used in ASTM 1670. Um, and it's squirted through this cannula uh, in the middle of the picture to a mask, which is going to be fastened on the right-hand side um, where that pink thing is. Here's a picture. It, it would squirt the blood at the mask, um, and then you'd check to see if any of the blood came through the mask on the other side. And that, that's probably the coolest-looking test that we have. So there's three different pressures that we can test at, um, 80 millimeters, 120 and 160 millimeters mercury, um, mimicking arterial pressures. Um, again, the, the blood is adjusted to, to 42 dynes, or uh, have it in newton meters here, and a specific gravity of 1.005. Samples are preconditioned the same way they are for BFE, 21 degrees C, 85% relative humidity. And um, so this sample, just the, that squirt of blood is calibrated each time. Um, and the test samples have to be um, observed for penetration within 10 seconds after the squirt of blood has hit the mask or touched the mask. Uh, per the test standard, it's 32 samples, um, and then every 16 samples, like I said, we make sure that we're delivering the proper amount of blood. Uh, it's about a 12-day turnaround time for that test. Uh, 32 is the minimum amount per the test standard, and then we need a full mask to test that, and it's about $265 for the whole set of 32 samples. And just we'll just uh, uh, close it up here by talking about the guidance documents. Um, ASTM F2100 uh, is the guidance document for medical face masks, and you can see most of the tests we talked about for masks are listed here, and it just gives us, if you want a low, moderate, or high barrier uh, rating. It tells us what you have to get for BFE, um, what the differential pressure rating needs to be, um, what pressure it has to pass at. We talked about the three arterial pressures, 80, 120, 160. Um, the only thing we didn't talk about here is um, the submicron particulate filtration efficiency testing. Um, we just didn't have time to cover that, but if you have questions about it, go ahead and send them in. Um, also, flame spread or flammability is the other one we didn't. Uh, talk about here, and then for EN testing, we just I just have a real quick chart for the EN uh, guidance document, um, and so EN classifies our masks as type one or type one R, meaning resistant to the splash of the blood, or type two and type two R. And so we just have the same type of thing. We have our requirements laid out um, for us, and and we know exactly what we, what results will allow us to classify our masks as. Um, and that about sums it up. I'm going to turn the time over to Mike here, and we'll get to some questions, I think. Well, thanks, Ben. Thanks for your uh, your webinar today. Uh, I think we all have been 
uh, learned some great information today. Um, ben and uh, Ben will be answering as many questions as we can for the uh, last about 10 minutes that we have today. Also joining Ben will be Todd Hillam, uh, the aerobiology section leader um, that's over the department for this type of testing. So I'll turn the time back over to Todd and Ben. And if you have any questions, please continue to submit them, and we'll get through as many as we can. Hi, this is uh, Todd Hillam. Uh, first question is asking if we have, uh, let's see, is there any test methods that use a viral challenge rather than a bacteria for the BFE test? Um, if so, which ones um, are they, and do now, does Nelson do, uh, conduct that testing? Um, there isn't a standard. There's nothing specified in the standards for a virus uh, filtration efficiency test. Uh, the uh, tables that were put up there at the end of the uh, presentation are the requirements for the ASTM uh, 2101, the requirements for medical face masks, and the EN, and those just require the bacteria. Um, having said that, we do at Nelson Labs have a vir virus efficiency test that is performed in the same manner as the bacterial filtration filtration efficiency test, um, just to understand that we use the same FIEX uh, bacteriophage that was explained in the, the uh, gown testing, um, but just understanding that the particle size um, for that test will be identical to the 3 micron as the BFE test. So it, you know, even if we do that testing, um, you have to be careful as far as claims go, as far as saying that you know it can withstand a virus like influenza because um, there's different uh, um, methods of uh, filtration and, and um, infection that way. Uh, so that kind of answers that question. Uh, if you have more specific questions with that, uh, feel free to, to email Dan or myself and we can, uh, we can help answer specific questions. All right, uh, next question here is, um, do, uh, do you need to cut the test samples yourselves? And the answer to that is no, you don't. You can if you want. Um, we will cut um, you know a few test samples if you're testing you know three four five test samples we'll cut them out for you for free um, if you're testing like 32 test samples and we have a nominal fee I think it's like hundred and sixty dollars to cut out um, 32 or or 20 maybe it's 20 or more samples um, so but either way you can you can cut them yourself and save a little time or save a little money or you can have us do it another question I have here is what if your drape is not large enough um, that's a great question because we do see that a lot, um, and it's not really addressed in the standard. Uh, so what we do is just do the best we can. So if you have a, uh, I don't know, like a three-inch um, seam or something, uh, on we just try and center that in the middle of the eight-inch by eight-inch sample or seven by thirteen sample, and uh, try and get as much of it as we can. We have a question here on. Uh, in NIOSH testing, which uh, refers more to uh, respirators, uh, the question is, have we heard of any NIOSH face mask tests that would be applicable to hoods? Um, you could probably best to, to go ahead and contact us uh, directly. We can answer more on that. Um, uh, you know, this, this presentation is more on actual face mask. Uh, our expert on um, respirators and NIOSH um, isn't necessarily in the room, but, but I know that you have to, we have to work through NIOSH to, to understand exactly what portion of that hood you know, is, is considered a respirator, so we can uh, evaluate how to test that. But uh, we could, you know, go ahead and contact us, and we can try to um, uh, help you understand that more, and see if we can find a, a good uh, application for for that product. And as far as the next question says, can I claim a 99% filtration efficiency following the ASTM 2100 guideline? If so, what tests are required, and what are the acceptance criteria? Um, so, a 99% filtration efficiency. Um, would, would come from the BFE test, the bacterial filtration efficiency test. Um, and uh, when, when your sample is tested, um, you get your filtration efficiency result. And if it's a 99% um, efficient, um, depending on your sample size, um, it, um, for your, your claim with the FDA, you know, it's hard for us to say what your claim can actually be, because the FDA really um, controls labeling and, and claims when it comes to the medical device products, um, but from your results, you definitely could justify, you know, a, a claim most likely when it comes to that. But I can't say yes or no that it would be accepted by the FDA. 
Um, but but that is the testing you would do, uh, that BFD testing, in order to make a claim um, of a 99% filtration efficiency. Okay, here's a, a good question. Which testing is more challenging, um, i.e. smaller particle size, BFE or VFE? Um, that's a good question. VFE uses uh, the the viral, uh, the virus, uh, phi x174, which we talked about for the um, viral penetration testing. It's a smaller particle. However, um, the mean particle size is still going to be the same size when it's aerosolized. So the, the particle size is still three micrometers, so they're going to be equivalent even though it's a smaller microorganism. Um, yeah. So it, it's basically you have the same size particle size. There's a little more penetration with the VFE, but um, not, not a lot. Okay, let's see. Um, question here about NIOSH pre-certification. Yeah, for respirators, we do perform a pre-certification for respirators uh, according to the NIOSH test methods. Um, that is required by NIOSH prior to uh, submitting to NIOSH for your actual certification. Uh, we can't help with that. Okay. I had a question here I saw about um, the hydrostatic pressure test, see if I can find it here, about the rate that we ramp it up at. Um, and the, the answer is that we, the, the rate ramps up at about one millibar per second. That's what the machine is set at. So it just doesn't uh, increase the pressure and explode it quickly. It's, it's a slow rise. I'm right, just kind of reading through the, the questions here. We'll get to another one. Um, as far as a uh, question here on um, does Nelson perform biocompatibility testing um, in support of mass gowns and or drapes? Um, yes, we do. Uh, uh, so those are required. Um, for any of those products, the biocompatibility testing, and just go ahead and you can contact us, and we can we can get you to the group that will uh, th th that is knowledgeable and can give you a, a breakdown of what is required for those. Um, but yes, we here at Nelson do perform all that testing. Okay, a question on um, is the sodium chloride penetration test more stringent than a BFE VFE penetration test? And yeah, the for for respirators, um, you use the sodium chloride penetration for a um, for a portion of that test. Um, and yes, that is it is a more stringent test for for the sodium chloride penetration test. They use a 0.3 um, micron particle uh, as opposed to a 3 micron. Now there's literature and, and the studies that show that the 0.3 micron particle size is the most penetrating particle size, and so it is a, is a more stringent test. And you will get uh, if, if you run your regular face mask in comparison with a BFE compared to sodium chloride, um, you're most likely to get a lot lower uh, 
filtration efficiency uh, doing that method. That's why it, it's required for respirators that have a, a, a more stringent requirement going through the NIOSH uh, method rather than just a face mask material that's used for uh, for uh, basic uh, wearing and, and protection um, of, of you know the of the wearers, uh, the patients, or the the doctors. Okay, we have time for uh, one more question. Let's see if we can get one here. And if, if we didn't get your question answered, feel free to uh, to email us, uh, give us a call, and we can we can talk through any of these uh, the questions that we may have missed. Okay, I have a question here as to why uh, a manufacturer would want to claim a one level one, two, or three. Um, one of the reasons could be just um, because the consumer is looking for that level of protection. It can be labeled right on the package. So as far as marketing goes, that can help. Another reason might be because the, the Amy PB70 document is actually an FDA recognized document. It has a rec uh, FDA number associated with it. So um, it can help to uh, smooth your, your 510k submission by just referring uh, to compliance to that standard. So there's a couple of reasons why you'd want to uh, claim a level one, two, or three, or use the MEP 70 guidance document. Uh, thanks, Ben and Todd. And unfortunately, we're out of time for the sh session today. But we'd like to thank everyone for attending our webinar. Uh, again, this webinar uh, was recorded and will be up on the Nelson Labs website within the next few days. Um, we want to make you aware of our next webinar, which will be after the first of the year, uh, January 26th, 2011, and it will be on medical device testing, start with a strategy and a plan. It's basically the go through the, the testing process. Um, you'll be able to register for that event sh uh, on the Nelson Labs website shortly. Again, uh, we are very happy that you were all able to attend, and uh, we hope that you have a great day. Thank you.